Last year, I received the Marine Conservation Photography Grant from Save Our Seas Foundation. I just want to take the opportunity to mention to the emerging photographers in the room that they're opening this grant again today. Um, so I went to False Bay in South Africa to do a story about the reef fishes. False Bay lies uh, just underneath Cape Town, and it's the largest true bay in southern Africa. In fact, it's so big that the sailors who would return from the Far East and arrive there would mistakenly think that they'd already made it back around the Cape of Good Hope. Must have been a little bit disappointing when they found out they'd still had to cross, but hence the name False Bay. And it's an incredible place. It lies at the intersection of two major ocean currents, the Benguela coming in from the cold Atlantic in the west, and the Agulas coming in from the warm Indian Ocean in the east. And as a result, it has an incredible diversity. Uh, it's a really productive ecosystem. So you can see here that its rocky reefs offer a foothold for all sorts of marine invertebrates. Also, there are four different species of kelp, uh, and they provide shelter for all sorts of reef fishes, uh, sharks, seals, penguins. And I remember more than one occasion when I surfaced from a dive to find that a pot of humpback whales was swimming by just 100 meters away. So it's a magical, incredible place to, to be able to dive and visit. But there is a grim side to the story of the bay. This is a glimpse of what the bay might have looked like 100 years ago. The fish with the, the big humps on their heads, they're called red stump nose. They can live up to 50 years, and they were once so numerous that uh, there's a description from the 1800s that speaks about the waters of Falls Bay turning red just with these fish. But today, the only place where you can see something like this, and the only place where I could take this picture, was in the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, in the kelp forest exhibit. Today, 70% of the commercially targeted linefish species have collapsed. And I want to make a point about overfishing. I think when we talk about overfishing, too often we consider only large industrial scale fishing. Um, you know, the large trawlers that land fish by the tons. And of course, these are often very destructive for our oceans. But then we act as though line fishing, um, line fishing meaning any kind of fishing with a hook and a line, like a spear, spear gun, but not long lining. So we, we tend to act like line fishing is a sustainable method just because it is selective. And when it comes to reef fishes, that is really not true because their biology makes them incredibly vulnerable to overfishing. Reef fishes tend to live very long. They grow very slowly. For instance, there's a species called red stembras, and this species takes seven years before it reaches the age where it's able to reproduce. So if you catch a fish younger than that, it hasn't has had a chance to replenish the fishing stock. And on top of that, they spawn in aggregations, which makes them very easy to target for fishermen. And making it worse yet, they're very territorial. So they hardly migrate, which means that a group of fishermen can quite easily clean out a reef in a very short time, and this reef will take half a century to recover or more. Um, South Africa, broadly speaking, has recreational fisheries and commercial fisheries, just like anywhere else. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the recreational fishery first. So for a photographer, of course, the problem with this kind of story is always how do you photograph something that's no longer there? This is Jeff Fridgen, he's a local spear fisherman. And in 1968, he posed for a picture with a one meter long white mussel cracker that he just speared off Cog Bay. And almost to the day, 46 years later, I asked him to pose in the same space where he posed for that original picture. 
Today he couldn't pose with the white muscle cracker anymore because it's largely disappeared from the bay, certainly fish of this size. Recreational fishing is by numbers the most important fishery in, in South Africa. Um, the latest estimate is from 2007 and it suggests that close to a million recreational fishermen are active in South Africa. So of course, we are almost a decade further and to put this in perspective, the figures from a decade earlier, from 1996, was only half a million. So it's, it's growing and you can see in this picture how popular it is. I mean, this, this guy here on the right, his name is Jonathan, he has a, the golden tooth and the green hat. He's 25, he works in the fashion industry. He's a, he's a hip guy and uh, this is just an average Sunday afternoon. There's more than 100 people here on the jetty of Kogbe Harbor fishing. And with the advent of small boats um, that are relatively cheap, every reef out there is in reach. So it really has a big impact on the fishes of South Africa, uh, Falls Bay in particular. And then uh, there's the commercial uh, sector. And I was imagining this to be a kind of fishery with the industrial skill boats before I came to South Africa. But that turns out not to be the case. These are quite small boats. They leave the harbor in the middle of the night. They go out, it takes about three, four hours. And then as the sun comes up, they start fishing. And it's a traditional handline fishery. Maybe there's nine, ten people on a boat. Uh, this is Garth. He's tying a fishing line. And you can see the, the protection on his fingers because they drag out these heavy fish just with their hands. They all have terrible scars. And it's a rough, rough way to make a living. It was also one of the more special things for me to have them allow me into their lives and appreciate the world from their perspective. So people tend to think of fish only as a source of food that ends up on their plate, at least in South Africa, because this is the only way they ever see fish. So for this story, it was very important for me to photograph the fish as beautiful animals in their own rights, in their natural environment, and so that we can show this to South Africans and we can show that they can be proud of their fish. This, take for example, this is a, a red Roman. If you were to be born as a red Roman, you would be born a girl, and you would have a very long, difficult journey across the reef. Hopefully, find yourself a nice territory. At the age of about three or four, you'd be able to reproduce. And then when the time is right, you turn into a man. They change sex in the middle of their life. And I'm, I'm telling you this just to illustrate that these fishes, they are, they have intrinsic value, and we should think of them uh, just as we look at tigers and sea turtles and dolphins. I think even sharks these days have better PR than reef fishes. Um, and this is uh, 17 smoothhound sharks that I photographed being landed on the dock in Kalpe Harbor one day. And I suspect that there's nobody in this room who doesn't feel a little bit sad to see this picture. So the point that I want to make is that if a creature as, with as fierce a reputation as a shark, if we can collectively, through outreach, through photography, through campaigns, uh, come to the point where we feel sad for a, an animal with such a reputation of, sorry, being a bloodthirsty animal, then surely we can do the same for these fishes that have never eaten a human being. As much as I wanted to give these fishes a face, I also wanted to do the same for the fishermen, the local fishermen, the commercial, traditional line fishermen. Because in South Africa, 30,000 households depend on fishing directly for their food security. And this had me thinking that Spain, the country where I live today, has the largest fishing fleet of Europe. And it's largely kept afloat by European Union subsidies. The fleet is owned by a handful of wealthy families for the most part. And if I contrast that with what I've seen in, in South, America, uh, South, South Africa, <laughs> excuse me, um, these people, they're already poor to begin with. 
30,000 households, that's well over 100,000 people, I imagine. And if a fishery like this collapses, it hits them really hard. It's their primary food security. So the tragedy is not just for the fishes, it's also really a tragedy for the people there who really depend on it. Um, I, I, for lack of time, I won't mention you all their life stories, but for instance, this, this is Bruno. He's been a fisherman for over 20 years. Um, this is Abdul Razak. He looks like a wise old man. And he is, but trust me, he cracks the dirtiest jokes of them all. <laughs> this is Naim, the skipper. Keith. Garth. Noni. He lives in the harbor. He's been fishing the longest. At least he told me he's been on these fishing boats since he was eight years old. His body is covered in scars from the snook they're fish with big teeth and they, they live a rough life. This is, this is me just taking the pictures in the studio. Sheet and some lights in the harbor. This is a fish lying there being sold. All right, so in a nutshell, this is uh, South Africa, um, Pulse Bay, the crisis of the reef fishes. So let's look at some solutions. Um, like most places in the world, South Africa has what they call there the Sustainable Seafoods Initiative. And so they educate people about which fish to buy, which fish not to buy, which are more sensitive to overfishing, and which are fine to eat. Uh, I photographed, uh, this is um, a local chef. He owns two restaurants in Cape Town. And he is an ambassador for the Sustainable Seafoods Initiative. So he uh, serves only sustainably caught fish in his restaurants. And um, the primary reason I was assigned this story by Save Our Seas is because of uh, this woman. This is Lauren DeVos. She is a, a PhD scientist working on mapping the fishes of the bay. And she's fighting tooth and nails to protect these, these fish. Um, but her research. Uh, means that she takes these machines that you see here, they're called BRUVs, which is an acronym for Baited Remote Underwater Vehicle. And this one is a stereo BRUV, uh, which is a special kind of BRUV that allows uh, the researchers not only to see which species of fish live in a certain place, but also how big they are. And that's a direct measure for uh, how old they are. So they, they get a very detailed image of the population of fish. Uh, and the way this works, as you can probably tell from the baited, is that there's bait in the canister here, and then uh, a lot of fish are attracted. And there's a camera in the, on the two cameras on the sides, the light in the middle, so they register everything. And by doing this in all, all places in the bay, they can make, create a map of the diversity of the fishes and how well the population is doing. And they can overlap that with data about where people are fishing and what the geography is like. So this is all good, but really the bottom line for uh, the fishes of False Bay is marine protected areas. So I come back to the Red Roman because the Red Roman is a little bit of a su success story. We're, it's one of the few species that are showing strong signs of recovery inside marine protected areas. So marine protected areas work. The problem in South Africa is that they're not enforced very well. One day, I was out on a fishing boat, and I was really shocked to discover that there were about 30 boats that morning fishing inside the no-take protected area of the reserve. This, this part, this was not the shock. The shock was that then a government patrol boat came over and started inspecting every fishing boat for licenses and wished them a good day. So either um, they're not aware or they're not willing to protect it, but this is a big problem. And the marine protected areas need to be bigger. There need to be more of them. So the bottom line for these fish is the solution is on paper really simple. We need more MPAs and better enforcement. So let's talk about a few of the ways Save Our Seas is uh, using these images just to wrap up. 
Um, first of all, they have a lovely magazine. This is the spread from a 20-page feature they ran this summer. Uh, of course, the magazine doesn't really reach the, the local people. So they also have a cool website with inter an interactive uh, feature. There's all sorts of videos. You can hear the fishermen speaking. Really cool. The thing I'm most excited about is uh, this. Right now, there is an exhibit in Falls Bay um, on a very busy, popular walkway. It's outdoors. It will be there all year. And so locals and tourists alike can come there and can appreciate how beautiful these fish are. And for, in many cases, the first time, get to see what these fish look like when they're alive underwater in their natural environment. And of course, this is a great hook for the local media to write about these issues. So this is, uh, in this case, the local people's post. And then there's a quote in there about how South Africa needs better protection of the marine protected areas. So the cool thing about these exhibits is that they're an excellent hook for media. And hopefully, this way, the South Africans of the future, like nine-year-old Leila, will have fish to appreciate, and fish for, and eat. Thank you.